Excerpt from Petrarch's Secret by Francesco Petrarca, 1304-1374. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the First Dialogue Between Petrarch and St. Augustine Petrarch, I believe there is a multitude of things for which we ardently long, which we seek for with all our energy, but which nevertheless, however diligent we are, we never have obtained and never shall. St. Augustine, that may be true of other desires, but in regard to that we have now under discussion, the case is wholly different. Petrarch, what makes you say that? St. Augustine, because every man who desires to be delivered from his misery, provided only he desires sincerely and with all his heart, cannot fail to obtain that which he desires. Petrarch, O oh, Father, what is this I hear? There are few men indeed who do not feel they lack many things, and who would not confess they were so far unhappy. Everyone who questions his own heart will acknowledge it is so. By natural consequence, if the fullness of blessing makes man happy, all things he lacks will so far make him unhappy. This burden of unhappiness all men would fain lay down, as everyone is aware, but everyone is aware also that very few have been able. How many there are who have felt the crushing weight of grief through bodily disease? or the loss of those they loved, or imprisonment, or exile, or hard poverty, or other misfortunes it would take too long to tell over. And yet they who suffer these things have only too often to lament that it is not permitted them, as you suggest, to be set free. To me, then, it seems quite beyond dispute that a multitude of men are unhappy by compulsion and in spite of themselves st augustine i must take you a long way back and as one does with the very young whose wits are slight and slow i must ask you to follow out the thread of my discourse from its very simplest elements i thought your mind was more advanced and i had no idea you still needed lessons so childish ah if only you had kept in mind those true and saving maxims of the wise which you have so often read and re-read with me if i must take leave to say you had but wrought for yourself instead of others if you had but applied your study of so many volumes to the ruling of your own conduct instead of to vanity and gaining the empty praise of men you would not want to retail such low and absurd follies Petrarch, I know not where you want to take me, but already I am aware of the blush mounting to my brow, and I feel like schoolboys in presence of an angry master. Before they know what they are accused of, they think of many offenses of which they are guilty, and at the very first word from the master's lips they are filled with confusion. In like case, I too am conscious of my ignorance and of many other faults, and though I perceive not the drift of your admonition, yet as I know almost everything bad may be brought against me, I blush even before you have done speaking. So pray state more clearly what is this biting accusation that you have made. St. Augustine, I shall have many things to lay to your charge presently. Just now what makes me so indignant is to hear you suppose that anyone can become or can be unhappy against his will. Petrarch I might as well spare my blushes, for what more obvious truth than this can possibly be imagined? What man exists so ignorant or so far removed from all contact with the world as not to know that penury, grief, disgrace, illness, death, and other evils, too, that are reckoned among the greatest, often befall us in spite of ourselves, and never with our own consent, from which it follows that it is easy enough to know and to detest one's own misery, but not to remove it, so that if the first two steps depend on ourselves, 
the third is nevertheless in fortune's hand st augustine when i saw you ashamed i was ready to give you pardon but brazen impudence angers me more than air itself how is it you have forgotten all those wise precepts of philosophy which declare that no man can be made unhappy by those things you rattle off by name now if it is virtue only that makes the happiness of man which is demonstrated by cicero and a whole multitude of weighty reasons it follows of necessity that nothing is opposed to true happiness except what is also opposed to virtue this truth you can yourself call to mind even without a word from me at least unless your wits are very dull petrarch i remember it quite well you would have me bear in mind the precepts of the stoics which contradict the opinions of the crowd and are nearer truth than common custom is st augustine you would indeed be of all men the most miserable were you to try to arrive at the truth through the absurdities of the crowd or to suppose that under the leadership of blind guides you would reach the light you must avoid the common beaten track and set your aspirations higher take the way marked by the steps of very few who have gone before if you would be counted worthy to hear the poet's word on brave lad on your courage leading you so only heaven is scaled footnote aeneid nine six forty one and footnote petrarch heaven grant i may hear it ere i die but i pray you to proceed for i assure you i have by no means become shameless i do not doubt the stoics rules are wiser far than the blunders of the crowd i await therefore your further counsel st augustine since we are agreed on this that no one can become or be unhappy except through his own fault what need of more words is there petrarch just this need that i think i have seen very many people and i am one of them of whom nothing is more distressful than the inability to break the yoke of their faults though all their life long they make the greatest efforts to do so wherefore even allowing that the maxim of the stoics holds good one may yet admit that many people are very unhappy in spite of themselves yes and although they lament it and wish they were not with their whole heart st augustine we have wandered somewhat from our course but we are slowly working back to our starting point or have you quite forgotten once we set out petrarch i had begun to lose sight of it but it is coming back to me now st augustine what i had set out to do with you was to make clear that the first step in avoiding the distresses of this mortal life and raising the soul to higher things is to practice meditation on death and on man's misery and that the second is to have a vehement desire and purpose to rise when these two things were present i promised a comparatively easy ascent to the goal of our desire unless haply to you it seems otherwise petrarch i should certainly never venture to affirm this for from my youth upwards i have had the increasing conviction that if in any matter i was inclined to think differently from yourself i was certain to be wrong st augustine we will please waive all compliments and as i observe you are inclined to admit the truth of my words more out of deference than conviction pray feel at liberty to say whatever your real judgment suggests petrarch i am still afraid to be found differing but nevertheless i will make use of the liberty you grant not to speak of other men i call to witness her who has ever been the ruling spirit of my life you yourself also i call to witness how many times i have pondered over my own misery and over the subject of death with what floods of tears i have sought to wash away my stains so that i can scarce speak of it without weeping yet hitherto as you see all is in vain this alone leads me to doubt the truth of that proposition you seek to establish that no man has ever fallen into misery but of his own free will 
or remained miserable except of his own accord the exact opposite of which i have proved in my own sad experience st augustine that complaint is an old one and seems likely to prove unending though i have already several times stated the truth in vain i shall not cease to maintain it yet no man can ever become or can be unhappy unless he so chooses but as i said at the beginning there is in men a certain perverse and dangerous inclination to deceive themselves which is the most deadly thing in life for if it is true that we rightly fear being taken in by those with whom we live because our natural habit of trusting them tends to make us unsuspicious and the pleasantly familiar sound of their voice is apt to put us off our guard how much rather ought you to fear the deceptions you practice on yourself where love influence familiarity play so large a part a case wherein every one esteems himself more than he deserves loves himself more than he ought and where deceiver and deceived are one and the same person petrarch you have said this kind of thing pretty often to-day already but i do not recollect ever practising such deception on myself and i hope other people have not deceived me either st augustine now at this very moment you are notably deceiving yourself when you boast never to have done such a thing at all and i have a good enough hope of your own wit and talent to make me think that if you pay close attention you will see for yourself that no man can fall into misery of his own will for on this point the whole discussion rests i pray you to think well before answering and give your closest attention and be zealous for truth more than for disputation but then tell me what man in the world was ever forced to sin for the seers and wise men require that sin must be a voluntary action and so rigid is their definition that if this voluntariness is absent then the sin also is not there but without sin no man is made unhappy as you agreed to admit a few minutes ago petrarch i perceive that by degrees i am getting away from my proposition and am being compelled to acknowledge that the beginning of my misery did arise from my own will i feel it is true in myself and i conjecture the same to be true of others now i beg you on your part to acknowledge a certain truth also st augustine what is it you wish me to acknowledge petrarch that as it is true no man ever fell involuntarily so this also is true that countless numbers of those who thus are voluntarily fallen nevertheless do not voluntarily remain so i affirm this confidently of my own self and i believe that i have received this for my punishment as i would not stand when i might so now i cannot rise when i would st augustine that is indeed a wise and true view to take still as you now confess you were wrong in your first proposition so i think you should own you were wrong in your second petrarch then you would say there is no distinction between falling and remaining fallen st augustine no they are indeed different things that is to say different in time but in the nature of the action and in the mind of the person concerned they are one and the same petrarch i see in what knots you entangle me but the wrestler who wins his victory by a trick is not necessarily the stronger man though he may be the more practised st augustine it is truth herself in whose presence we are discoursing to her plain simplicity is ever dear and cunning is hateful that you may see this beyond all doubt i will go forward from this point with all the plainness you can desire petrarch you can give me no more welcome news tell me then as it is a question concerning myself by what line of reasoning you mean to prove i am unhappy i do not deny that i am but i deny that it is with my own consent that i remain so for on the contrary i feel this to be most hateful and the very opposite of what i wish 
but yet i can do nothing except wish saint augustine if only the conditions laid down are observed i will prove to you that you are misusing words petrarch what conditions do you mean and how would you have me use words differently saint augustine our conditions were to lay aside all juggling with terms and to seek truth in all plain simplicity and the words i would have you use are these instead of saying you cannot you ought to say you will not petrarch there will be no end then to our discussion for that is what i never shall confess i tell you i know and you yourself are witness how often i have wished to and yet could not rise what floods of tears have i shed and all to no purpose st augustine oh yes i have witnessed many tears but very little will petrarch heaven is witness for indeed i think no man on this earth knows what i have suffered and how i have longed earnestly to rise if only i might st augustine hush hush heaven and earth will crash in ruin the stars themselves will fall to hell and all harmonious nature be divided against itself sooner than truth who is our judge can be deceived petrarch and what do you mean by that st augustine i mean that your tears have often stung your conscience but not changed your will petrarch i wonder how many times i must tell you that it is just this impossibility of change which i bewail st augustine i wonder how many times i must reply that it is want of will not want of power which is the trouble and yet i wonder not that now you find yourself involved in these perplexities in which in time past i too was tossed about when i was beginning to contemplate entering upon a new way of life footnote st augustine confessions eight eight and footnote i tore my hair i beat my brow my fingers i twisted nervously i bent double and held my knees i filled the air of heaven with most bitter sighs i poured out tears like water on every side yet nevertheless i remained what i was and no other until a deep meditation at last showed me the root of all my misery and made it plain before my eyes and then my will after that became fully changed and my weakness also was changed in that same moment to power and by a marvellous and most blessed alteration i was transformed instantly and made another man another augustine altogether the full history of that transformation is known if i mistake not to you already in my confessions petrarch yes in truth i know it well and never can i forget the story of that health-bringing fig-tree beneath whose shade the miracle took place st augustine well indeed you may remember it and no tree to you should be more dear no not the myrtle nor the ivy nor the laurel beloved of apollo and ever afterwards favored by all the bands of poets favored too by you above all who alone in your age have been counted worthy to be crowned with its leaves yet dearer than these should be to you the memory of that fig tree for it greets you like some mariner coming into haven after many storms it holds out to you the path of righteousness and a sure hope which fadeth not away that presently the divine forgiveness shall be yours petrarch i would not say one word in contradiction go on i beseech you with what you have begun End of excerpt from petrarch's secret by francesco petrarca 1304 to 1374